We then left off with the angels talking to Avram and Sarah and telling them that Sarah will have a child next year. Sarah laughed because she thinks it's, a, she thinks it's humorous. But Avram laughed because he recognized how, how marvelous this is. Okay, that's where we left off. So we have now some very interesting things that come up. The first is Sarah denied. When Hashem said, did you laugh? She said, no, I didn't. What's the question that you would ask there? She what? She told God that he's mistaken? Okay. So what do you think this means? So I want to talk to you about different levels of awareness. A person sometimes has very little awareness of themselves. When you're looking at somebody else, it's easy to maintain enough detachment to observe things as they are. When you're looking at yourself, it's possible not to. So when Sarah said, I didn't laugh, I mean, she certainly, like, she certainly didn't laugh out loud, like the kind of laughter where you fall off the chair and slap your side, but, um, which is interesting to imagine. So she, but she, she laughed, she saw it as humorous, but when Hashem said you laughed, the more integrated and higher self was saying, no, nothing is too much for Hashem. But the more authentic, lower self was still thought it was funny. You understand this? So there is different layers of self. So this is what's meant in Tillam when it says, V'nafshi odat ma'od, my soul knows very well which means your soul could also not know very well. There's room for self-deception. So there are five levels of soul. And parallel to the five levels of soul are five different powers that the soul itself has. So the five levels of souls are described by their names, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida. So the lowest level of soul, which is the self that we experience constantly, is called nefesh. So nefesh literally means that which rests. So it's the way the spiritual self rests against the the walls of the body. The first time a person goes to the Kotel, the experience could be intense. But it's dependent on your feet taking there, you there, your eyes seeing the Kotel, and you're having heard about the Kotel from other people. You could see this? So your spiritual experience, which uh, which is authentic, is tied down to your body. So therefore, if you didn't ever hear of the Kotel, and you were on a tour of the Mideast, and you made a wrong turn, you were headed towards um, the Shuk near the Damascus Gate, but gosh, you made a right instead of a left, and you see this like big plaza, and there were all of these people standing there for some reason, and you know, some of them are talking to a wall. You know, like you hear how people say, I, Talking to her is like talking to the wall. Okay, they're talking to a wall. Other people are taking pictures of themselves. Like, can you picture not being moved? So that's because your body's not on board. Your eyes didn't tell you what the informed eye would tell you. Your ear didn't tell you what the informed ear would tell you. Okay. So that part of you is subjective. It's dependent on the outside. The higher levels are not. So. If you go above nefesh, the the level above that is called ruach, which means spirit. There's a certain spirit of Hashem within people, but which is expressed primarily through um, through speech and through choosing. But even that is corruptible. But above that, you have neshama. Neshama means that which was breathed in. So in the morning prayers, one of the lines is neshama shnatata bi tohorahi. The neshama you gave me is pure. That's the incorruptible part of you. But we're not always in contact with it. So therefore, the mo- if you lose contact with your neshama, which happens to us all the time, there's place for subjectivity. So the Torah is including this very small sentence about Sarah. Not to say, oh, Sarah was a fool, she's contradicting God, no. Sarah was a prophetess, higher than Avram. Hashem told Avram to listen to her, not vice versa. But even Sarah, in the end, lives in the body and therefore descends to nefesh level very readily. So what's the point of knowing this? Now that you know this, what could you do with it? So what you could do with it, and this is like an important thing, one of the prayers you should say, even if you don't generally pray, even if you pray in your own language only, ask Hashem, to make you know your own heart. Okay, now after this, 
Okay, Avram accompanies his guests. We learned about this yesterday. And then Hashem says something very important. I want you to hear this verse. Vashem Amar, Hamichaseh Ani Avraham, At Asher Ani Oseh. Hashem says, would I cover up from Avram what I'm doing? And of course, the logical answer would be what? Yes. Okay, by and large, Hashem doesn't tell anybody what he's about to do. So we're going to have, in the Pasuk after this, a reason why Hashem won't hide anything from Avraham. So it says, Ki adativ, because I know him. He's going to command his children and his household after him. After him. And they'll guard Hashem's path. They'll do both charity and justice. And that will cause Hashem to bring upon Avram what he spoke. So the reason why Hashem won't hide anything from Avraham is because Avram is his conduit. Avram is going to be the one who passes on to generations who Hashem is and what he is. So therefore, Hashem will reveal more to Avram than he would to anybody else. This make sense to you? So what that means for you on a practical level is as follows. Everybody influences people. Is that true or not? So the more you see yourself as somebody else's access to charity, to justice, to truth, the more clarity you'll have, the more Hashem will reveal. So remember a moment I said, I said, ask Hashem to let you know your heart. The way to know your heart, what you could do for that, is to see that you're a conduit to Hashem in your relationships to other people. So I'm going to take the nature of this relationship into, I'm going to tell you all of the fragments, starting with Rashi. So Hashem says, because I knew him. So Rashi says something so radical, listen to what he says, Lashon Chiba, knowing, is loving. Real knowing is loving. So you could say there are lots of people I know who I don't love. In fact, the more I know them, the less I love them. Okay. So again, people are layered. So the outside could be very unlovable. But if you could ever penetrate to the neshama, you'll find something to love. So therefore, there's a rule. The more external a person is, the more status-oriented the more um, superficial, the more they'll be critical of other people because they'll never penetrate. The more spiritual a person is, the more ready they are to penetrate, the more possible it is for them to penetrate. So Hashem is saying, because he penetrates, I therefore also penetrate. So this is why the very first time in Torah where it uses the word knowing, do you, any of you know where that is? It says, Adam knew Chava, his wife. So we're not talking about superficial academic knowledge. You must be Chava. I'm Adam. No, we're talking about intimate knowledge. We're talking about absolute knowledge. Okay, so what does Hashem know about Avram? When he looks at Avram on the deepest levels, what does he see? So he sees that what Avram wants more than anything is to transmit who Hashem is. So the specifics here are first to his children. We learned this in a previous class. The word ben, which means what? Son. Son. Is the root of the word binyan, which means what? Birth. Building. The word bat, which is what? Daughter, Daughter is the, word, uh, the root of the word bayit, which means house. So the idea is that when you see the person who you become when you parent a child, that builds your house, that builds your own personal building, your edifice. How does raising a child affect you? Why should it change you that much? So I want you to compare two people. Do you know anybody who volunteers in a serious way for organizations that do good work? Okay, yeah? Okay, what does the person who you know do? Um, he feeds the homeless people. Okay, that's, that's big. What, what does the person who you know do? Uh, she works for a hospice. Those are big things. We'll all agree. But when you work for a hospice or when you feed the homeless, you work when you want to work or you leave the job. Is that true? Okay. So there's a time when you say, let's say you work at the hospice and your, your shift ends at um, 10 at night. Let's say you were, or, or actually shifts always end at 11, at 7 to 11 in hospitals. 
You go home, and then what do you do? You get home by, t by the time you get home, it's 12. You go to bed. You get up, it's, let's say, 7 in the morning. You have a day. You won't be going back to the hospice until when? 7 in the evening. This is clear? When you have a child, when you have a young child, do you have respite? Not really. Even if you have your child in daycare or whatever, your responsibility in your mind is constantly on the child. Is that true? So this is Hashem's plan. Why do you think he made it this way? He could have made humans very different. A horse walks away from its own birth. Human babies are dependent completely on their parents till what age? Yeah, 35. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how much you need a graduate degree, but whatever. Um, okay. Much longer, though, right? So the reason is the more you have to be there for your child consistently, the more you're teaching your child exactly what it says in the text. You're teaching them justice and charity. You're teaching them that if you have a responsibility, you keep it, and you have to be kind. So this is how humans learn justice and charity through their parents. So this is why Hashem says he won't hide things from Avram, because he knows Avram will transmit this. Okay, so what isn't he hiding? So we learned yesterday a little bit about the destruction of Sodom. Do you remember this still? Did we get as far as this in this class or only in Yisod? We did? Okay, so here's what the, t what the Torah tells us about it. It says, Hashem says, I hear the outcry of Sodom and that it's increasing. What outcry is this referring to? We learned about their selfishness yesterday. Do you know the Midrash about the specific outcry? There was a girl, and she did the terrible crime of letting in a stranger. So how did they punish her? They covered her body in honey, and they put her on the roof for the bees to consume her. So she was screaming, of course. So Hashem said, of all of the sounds that the universe makes, my ear, so to speak, is attuned to her cry. So this is the cry that sealed the fate of Sodom. OK, and he saw it's increasing. So there are two kinds of sins that by their nature increase. One is selfishness, and the other is promiscuity. Why do you think selfishness, especially financially oriented selfishness, increases? Why do people who steal a little end up stealing a lot? Yeah? Okay, so people justify everything. But there's a basic rule. Again, if you're not a person who knows their neshama, who knows their nefesh, you still want satisfaction in life. So people try to get it materially or through the fulfillment of their desires. But there's a rule. The rule is as soon as you have it, you want something else. When it comes to material things, having it doesn't do it. So I want to show you how this operates. Were any of you ever hungry, not because you were on a diet or because you forgot to pack, but you really couldn't afford to buy food? Were any of you ever hungry like that? Imagine hardly anybody is in our circumstances. So imagine, could you imagine being hungry? OK, so here you are. You're you, and um, you go to work, and you know, your money just won't go far enough. You paid your rent. There's like nothing left. So you come without anything to work, and you're hungry. And you know, you're at the water fountain, you're, you're drinking a lot, you're hoping that people like leave things over. OK. So you think, if I only had food, then I'll be happy. Could you picture thinking that? Yeah? But we all have food. Are we all happy? No, because once you have it, it doesn't make you happy. Not having it makes you unhappy. But yes, having it doesn't make you happy. Move up a notch. What are some things that you would say, if I only had this, then I'd be happy? What are some things that you would have on your if, if only lists? New car. If I only had a new car, I'd be happy. Are all people with new cars happy? No. You can move it up more realistically. If I only found the right man and he wanted to marry me, then I'd be happy. Are all married couples happy? You know, OK, got this? So I want to I bring this like to life for you. Picture, you found the right guy. He loves you. You're getting married. You're under the chuppah. You're ecstatic, right? 
and he turns out to be just as good as you thought he is. Ten years down the road, remember, he's as good as you thought he is. No disillusionment. And reading breakfast. So he's reading, um, he's reading the financial section of, of um, the New York Times. And you're, um, and you're reading a magazine. OK, yeah? OK. Is that as it should be, or is something wrong? That's normal. That's life. You're not going to be under the chuppah for breakfast. You're not going to, like, if you were to get up and embrace him and say, I love you, <laughs> you would say, what happened? <laughs> OK, right? <laughs> I just want to read, like, the stocks, right? You know, because I invested, like, I'm not sure if I should sell or not. Like, you know, OK, right? It's normal. And the reason was, even with the deepest things, once you have it, you want something else or more. OK, clear? So because of this, when Hashem saw how, how selfish the people of Sodom are and how monetarily oriented they were, he realized this could only get worse. So now we're going to go through Avram's bargaining. Yesterday we learned the bargaining on the outside. OK, so Avram started with a certain number. Which number did he start with? Do you know? 50. Why 50? Why did he say if there were 2,000? What do you know about 50? Right. So he wanted 10 each. But he didn't, he didn't use the words, if each borough had 10. He says, if there are 50. So you may be familiar with this. There are 50 gates of wisdom, and parallelly, 50 date, gates of defilement. You may have heard this in connection with the Exodus. It says the Jews had to make matzah, get out immediately, because they were almost at what? the 50th gate, which would have made them irredeemable. OK, clear? So what do we mean when we talk about these gates? What's this talking about? So bear with me. It's a big idea. There are seven traits that we share in common with Hashem, because we're in his image. So what are they? The first one and main one is chesed. All humans love giving. Could you see where this is so? This is why. Being in prison is such a terrible punishment. Even if a prison is well furnished and the person has a television, it's a terrible punishment because everyone wants to give. OK, could, you can see where this is so? The next most major trait that we share in common with Hashem is the desire to overcome evil, which translates on a human level to overcoming challenges, to meeting, to meeting challenges, and therefore doing achievements that mean, that mean something. So when, I, you know, when you ask people, what are the most happy moments of your life? What are some happy moments in your life? Think about your life. Tell me a happy moment. Invariably, when people are honest about this, their moments of great joy are moments of connection, where there's giving. Your sister's born. You're, she's gonna, you're going to love her. You're going to give to her. You're going to hold her, right? Or moments of achievement. I graduated. I did something. The diploma's in my hand. You can see where this is so? OK, the next one, the next trait we share in common with Hashem is our love of harmony and truth. So this is where our aesthetic sensitivities come from, our love of music, but also our love of truth. So truth is harmony. It's what when you're saying and what's happening match. People love truth. They did an experiment once with prisoners on death row in America. They wanted to see how the, these are not good people. These are people who were tried, convicted. Okay, so the person who serves them food d was um, included in the experiment. They have, they have clocks in the cells. Okay? So even so, the, pers the, the prisoner oftentimes, just to make conversation, will say, what time is it, even though they have clocks. So the, the servers, the food servers, were told to tell the wrong time. So if the clock says 4 o'clock, they would say 4.15. What would happen next? You tell me. Say, so no, it's not 4.15, it's 4 o'clock. And the server would say, no, look, it's 4.15. Do you think that the prisoners got upset? Yeah. Extremely upset. OK, clear? 
because it's contradictory to human nature to accept being lied to. These are people who murdered people, who raped people, who did horrific things, but they were offended by a lie involving 15 minutes on somebody else's watch. So here's another experiment you could make. Not that this is a nice thing to do, but they teach you to do this when you learn psychology and education. If you have young children, children who are verbal but young, like five, six, yeah? If you wake them up and they're just about to get up by calling them somebody else's name. Okay, got this? Like, Robert, get up. They get so upset and so angry, okay? Very disproportionate because it's so disarming. It's like, it puts them in such disharmony. I'm not Robert! <laughs> Okay, you know. Oh, I thought you were Robert. No! <laughs> okay, got it? Yeah? It was, in a, it was a psychological, they do a lot of experimentations on, on prisoners. It's one of the less moral things about the pres prison system. They also do medical experiments on them. There's a lot of stuff that isn't so moral that goes on in prisons. Okay. Um, next. The next trait that we share in common with Hashem is netzach, which means wanting to prevail. So we all have within us a certain sensitivity that there are things that are bigger than we are. So that's netzach. We have a sense of eternity. Did you have to read Tale of Two Cities when you were in school? How many of you did? Just curious where American education is. All right, some of you did. Do you remember the end? So the hero is being carted off to the guillotine, and he says, this is a far, far better thing than I've ever done. Now, that's Netzach talking. If, he, if there was no such thing as Netzach, you know what he'd be saying? This is a far, far stupider mess that I ever got myself into. OK, clear? So anybody who's willing to die for a cause has a sense of Netzach. Anybody who's willing to make any sacrifice for something bigger than themselves has a sense of Netzach. Does that make sense? Animals don't have Netzach. Next, the next trait is hod. Hod means splendor, literally. But it means being moved by things, being sensitive by things of spiritual beauty. So we're all moved. Somebody gives you th something that was important to you. You feel love, you feel gratitude. OK, clear? The next one is yesod, which literally means foundation. What it means in context is loyalty. So we all want a spiritual relationship to those who we are loyal to. This is why humans date. Okay, you won't have even, even animals that are monogamous, like elephants. They don't have to meet each other and have coffee and like, you know, say things like, well, it must have been so hard for you when your father died. Okay, they don't have to do this. Are you making aliyah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, humans do because we want a relationship that has a spiritual dimension to it, not just a physical one. With animals, even monogamous animals, you can mate any male with any female. You can't do this with people. Okay, clear? Last one. The last one is malchut, which is the desire to rule. So everybody wants to be in control of their lives. And most of us want to control the lives of others as well. OK, so those are the traits we share in common with Hashem. So they interact. That means chesed interacts with gvura. You'll overcome something to do an act of kindness. They all interact. So they're, in fact, seven times seven different <coughs> traits, since they all interact with each other. That makes sense to you? So that equals 49. You know how um, the, the whole is more than its parts? So the 50th gate is the, is the entirety of the personality that comes through the interactions of all of these traits. Does this make sense to you? So this is what we mean. There are 50 gates of Bina, 50 gates of understanding. You can look at any situations and understand, who should I be in this situation? Does this call for chesed? Does it call for grura? Does it call for loyalty? Does it call for gratitude? So in any situation where there are two choices, you either open a gate or close it. When you open it, 
the words that we would use is you've opened the gate of understanding. When you close it, you close a gate that leads to your defilement. So a lost, a lost opportunity has a negative effect. So now going back to what we're talking about. Avram began with the number 50. He said, maybe there are 50 righteous people. Maybe one person has chesed. One person has gvura. Between all of the thousands or maybe even millions of people in these five cities, maybe there's a combination that equals these 50. And if they're in one city, that's enough. One person who has these traits or several people together who have these traits can turn around to society. Is that true or not? What do you think? It's absolutely true. And I want you to think about this. Think about some great people who've changed the world. So his rhetoric had to have ears that could hear him. When he made his famous I Had a Dream speech, he had to have listeners who wanted justice, who wanted harmony, who want, okay, right? The, if he didn't have 50 people, if he would have made that speech in Uganda, he couldn't have created a civil rights movement that had any, that had any meaning, because he had no listeners. You understand this? So when Hashem said to Avram, there aren't 50, he knew that it wasn't going to be good. But 50 people could change it. Does this make sense to you? He went down from there to what? 45. 45. So he gave up on one of the cities. He went down from there to 40. Now the number 40 also has integral meaning in the Torah. Tell me some 40s that are there in the Torah. You should know this. 40 years of what? In the, desert. in the desert. 40 years in the desert. Tell me more. You know more. 40, 40 days that Moshe went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. Tell me another one. There's another one that you know for sure. 40 days of the flood. So you knew this, right? OK, so why 40? With all of these occasions, and there are more occasions in this, the spies, there are other occasions, 40 is a symbol of redefinition and rebirth. Why? Because on the 40th day, a fetus begins to actually have limbs and organs that take on human capacity. So I had a nurse once here as a student who told me on the 40th day, the heart begins to beat, which I thought was fascinating. So the reason why Hashem designed people this way is that it really is 10, like the days of creation, times four, the, the easily observed elements. When you have physical and spiritual meaning, you have a viable person. So when Avram said, maybe there are 40, all right, they're not righteous, there aren't 50, there's nobody who's listening, you're right. But maybe they could be reborn. Maybe something could happen that will wake them up. But in order to be woken up, you have to have human potential. Could people destroy their human potential? Yeah. Yes. So Hashem said, no 40. Avraham went down to 30. How could 30 help if people can't even be reborn and change? Why, like, why not just end it there? So the rule is that sometimes a person can't change as they are, but suffering could change almost anyone. So at this point, what Avraham was bargaining for wasn't that there should be business as usual. Let there be an earthquake. Let there be a tsunami. Let there be something that wakes them up. Let there be something. Now Hashem doesn't believe in beating a dead horse. So Hashem said no. He went down to 20 and to 10 in the hopes that only two of the cities or even one of the cities are redeemable. Nothing was redeemable. Now what we ended up with yesterday was when Avram was told that his bargaining won't work. He didn't say, and Hashem, where's your mercy? What did he say? He said, and this is an important thing, Anochi ofar ve'efer, I am dust and ashes. So what that means is he's saying, if I don't understand Hashem's ways, it's because of my own mortality, because of my own limitations, because of my own physicality, not because there's something wrong with Hashem. Okay, so most of us believe this on paper, so I want to illustrate this to you. You all attend seders at Pesach, is that true? You've been to a seder? Yes? And the seder that you go to, do they read the Haggadah? Because they're at seders where people just eat, okay? You read the Haggadah? Yes? 
Yes? Okay. So you know about the ten plagues, you know about the servitude. Is it possible, could you imagine somebody saying, well, if God can allow for this, I don't believe. Is that going to happen to the Seder? It's not going to happen. But the same people who could say, okay, the Jews were enslaved in Egypt for such a long amount of time and suffered so, so deeply, they'll accept that because they say, all right, but there's a bigger picture. Okay, in their own lives, they could suffer far less, and they'll say, where's God? Could you see where this is so? So the reason for this is tangibility has its own, has its own force. So there are things we could know and we could feel, but when something is material and tangible, it takes on a whole different perspective. So the greatness of Avram is he said, I'm dust and ashes. Why did he say dust and ashes as opposed to I'm nothing compared to God? So he referred to two incidences in his life. He said, if it wasn't for you, I'd be ashes. When would he have been ashes? When he was thrown in the fire. So that's visible, that's tangible. He says, I know where I could have been. I could have been ashes. When could he have been reduced to dust? When he went to war to save Lot, he could have easily been killed. He said, by now I would be dust, I'd be nothing. He was able to convey physical reality to make himself understand the depth of what he's really saying. Okay? That's it for now.